So ladies and gentlemen, it's a wonderful segue to come right into the next topic around further frictional costs. Uh, the financial transaction tax, which we'd like to focus uh, just a little bit on the factual aspects and maybe a few interesting insights from previous examples. So uh, Brian, maybe if I start briefly with you from the Irish Stock Exchange, um, what is your perspective around uh, stamp taxes, transaction taxes from an exchange perspective? Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, I think an interesting movement from the discussion we've just been talking about, which is, you know, MIFID going way back to MIFID 1 was meant to be about increasing comp competition, but also going right back to the financial, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 uh, the uh, going right back to the Lisbon Accord was about the competitiveness of Europe and the competitiveness of Europe on a global basis. That's actually, I think, somewhat been forgotten in the policy Malay, and nothing describes that better than, or no, nothing demonstrates that better than the financial transaction tax. Um, for me, first and foremost, the financial transaction tax, the timing is wrong, the structuring is wrong, and it is essentially Europe playing, you know, essentially a game of Russian or maybe Chinese roulette with the, comp with the competitiveness of the European financial market, basically. Um, the, just, just briefly, for the purpose of most of us probably know this, but the proposal dating back to September of, of last year is about a 10 basis point charge of transaction tax, 10 basis points, very bro of very broad scope on equities and, and bonds, and uh, essentially a one basis point charge for derivative transactions. Now, that might seem, you know, what's the scope of it? The scope is across those instruments, but it includes hedging transactions, it includes collateralization, um, it includes stock loans, basically. So it is very, very, very broadly, and it's actually, it's also extra jurisdictional. So only one party needs to have a foot in Europe. So you could be a US bank undertaking a transaction on behalf of an European corporate on a US exchange, and that would be subject to the proposed financial transaction tax. Um, now I think, you know, Europe does not need that now, and I think at a time when the, you know, on a more global basis, other markets are moving away from it. And at a, you know, from an Irish perspective, we have a stamp duty tax. Um, uh, we've we've had one for very many years, um, and that is it's similar to the stamp duty reserve tax in the UK at a at a higher level than in the UK. Um, and that is a, that is a very anti-competitive tax, basically. And that is a tax which is really on the end investor, I think. And that is another point to just like to bring out as a, as a first general theme. Transaction taxes like this are not taxes on financial institutions. They're taxes on the transactions and they're taxes ultimately on the end investor. And I think very neatly the point that um, I think Peter was just talking about in European context at a time of, you know, again in the context of the pensions time bomb, there's some very interesting research as to even a very low incidence financial transac transaction tax, what that does to pension performance essentially, and the break that that puts on pension performance over the longer term basically. So. Again, I think I um, uh, would be an absolute opponent of any financial transaction tax in, in, in the European context. Well, thank you, Brian. I'm going to come to you in a moment, Stephen. Just quickly, uh, Ralph, can you tell us from Bor Stuttgart's perspective, uh, I believe you also service quite a segment of uh, retail investors. Uh, what is your opinion based on what Brian just mentioned? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are one of the seven uh, other exchanges, uh, but Frankfurt, uh, who are taking care of private clients, not so much uh, the wholesale clients. So we are having a much more relaxed stance on what the text is from a pure end investor perspective. I mean, as you know, I mean, we, private clients are not trading that often, that heavily. It's not, we're not having uh, high frequency trading uh, in Stuttgart. So in theory, uh, we could say we could lean back and say, okay, private clients are not gonna uh, not gonna go. Uh, they are not so mobile like uh, like uh, institutional uh, investors. But the truth of the uh, uh, of the story, really, even for Stuttgart, is that on the other hand, uh, we have as well, of course, uh, uh, the liquidity providers and the issuers, and those are professionals who are infected quite heavily by this uh, uh, by this transaction tax. I mean, first of all, despite. Uh, 
uh, the, the heavy rhetorics coming out of Germany, as you all know, know uh, Schäuble uh, was heavily lobbying uh, within Europe for this uh, uh, transaction uh, tax. We don't see it coming, uh, uh, I'd say, after last week's uh, exchange of view within the uh, European level uh, at all. So what we, what we are feeling is, yes, especially in Germany and a few other uh, countries as well, we have something uh, which will be coming for sure, but it's rather going to be uh, uh, like maybe an island uh, and that will be then uh, be similar to a stamp duty. Uh, and then, of course, the question is how 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 vast, how how pronounced the stamp duty uh, will be. Um, in the end, we feel strongly, and as well for the uh, private investors, that such a, a, a tax would be uh, seizing liquidity to a certain extent, uh, extent. So the liquidity would be lower. The cost uh, of the trading for for the individuals will be getting higher. Yes, they cannot uh, they cannot go away easily to another legislation, but still they will face uh, all. Uh, the downsides and 10 basis points from our point of view uh, is very significant given the uh, given the uh, state of uh, the trading in Europe. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, Stephen, from your perspective, what are some of your factual oversights? Um, the facts of the the progress of FTT um, are that it was it was an obscure talking point about two years ago. And there was a lot of people in the industry who looked at it and felt that it couldn't come to anything because it was such an absurd suggestion that surely sense would prevail. Um, and I, I think that um, personally, and I should say that I, I want to be very candid in this conversation, so I will correct you that uh, I'm not necessarily representing Deutsche Bank's nor AFME's views, but speaking personally as, as someone who cares passionately about the efficiency of the capital markets and perhaps less than some of you would imagine about how the, the profits within it are allocated between the, the players, I see the potential uh, damaging effect to efficiency of um, a 10 basis point charge on transactions as absolutely horrendous. Um, you know, it's not quite significant. In the equity space, the um, recent Greenwich survey said that the, the average blended rate for execution is 10.8 basis points, so you're doubling it. But then I look at a, a survey from Oliver Wyman and um, they tell me that if you look at the um, euro dollar swap um, you can transact 25 million euros in that for a spread fee of about $257 on an average day. Um, this tax would be 2,500 euros each side. Um, you're increasing the transactional cost of that trade by 1,700%. Sorry, 1,700%. Um, and at this point, you start to say, well, what's it about? Because it, it just doesn't make sense. And I think what's happened in the industry, and here again, it's speaking from a personal perspective, um, there's been an awareness that um, this is a tax that is in a large part a populist tax, and that by being overly vocal and overly um, demonstrative about um, the effect it would have on our industry, um, we're served up with a conundrum or the catch-22 of fulfilling its key purpose, which is that those that are promoting it get the airtime um, of being criticised by the financial sector. So the financial sector um, has been left largely muted um, and relying on the facts to, take, to talk for themselves. Um, when I started looking at those um, facts, I was astounded to discover that the European Commission's proposal um, uh, was backed up by an impact assessment that said the impact would be negative. You would be um, having, a, uh, you would reduce GDP by in excess of half a percent across Europe by introducing this tax. It would introduce more cost in collection than revenue. Um, I then read a st study by a consulting group Oxira, one that is used regularly by the Commission as being an impartial observer of fact and not even without getting into their interpretation of facts, they spotted that that impact assessment um, understated the negative impact because 
um, when it calculated the revenue, it acknowledged that the tax was in buys and sells, but when it um, calculated the impact, it would appear to have only um, taken one side of the trade. So there was half as much um, impact or half as much tax on the impact side of the equation um, as there was on the revenue side. This started to really pique my interest. And um, when we were preparing for this, um, this panel, I asked who on the panel is going to be the defender of the, the FTT? Who is it I'm going to be able to have a good, decent debate with? Um, and funnily enough, they couldn't find anyone. There, there, there was no one here. Um, so I decided to, to actually do some primary research and try and read to the documents that were in support of the financial transaction tax. So I started with the European Commission's um, proposal that um, they've adopted. And um, again, a personal view, please, and I would appreciate if it wasn't too widely quoted. It doesn't really read as a proposal in support of a financial transaction tax. What it's actually saying is if you're stupid enough to do this, at least do it in a coordinated manner so you preserve um, the, the unity of the market across Europe. And it lists almost as many reasons not to do it as reasons for doing it. And it has no conviction whatsoever in the proposals around why you might want to. So I, I looked further and found the um, Social Democrats um, two-page document explaining why this should um, that this tax should be supported um, and you should read it you should definitely you should read it it's only two pages long um, but one of the points it asks it tries to answer is this point about who pays and um, it's got a section headed who pays pensioners question mark no exclamation mark um, it then explains that the average pension fund um, holds its assets for two years um, that means it's only selling 50% of its assets a year, and therefore it's only getting half the tax, which means 0.05% or five basis points tax. Now, at that point, I pause because I think they've misunderstood the tax. I think you pay it in buys and sells. So assuming you're not selling your portfolio and holding cash, you would still pay 0.1% a year. Um, but I'm thinking, well, that's, um, they're, they're, they've made a slight mistake there, but I'll read on. Um, they then talk about HFTs, and they say, HFTs will turn over their portfolio every day. Um, we won't get into whether that's a good description of HFT activity and whether you should have a concept of portfolio. Um, but they then say, that means that their tax will be 50% per annum. Now remember, this isn't 50% on profits. This is 50% on the capital deployed. Um, and I, and they say that is a hundred times more than would be the case for pension funds. And again, I got distracted because I think actually 50% is a thousand times more than five basis points. So not only do they not understand their own tax and how when it applies, but they're struggling with arithmetic as well. Um, but we've got two offsetting errors there, and it actually turns out that by their calculations, um, HFTs would pay 500 times more than pension funds. And I started getting irate within myself. And I was thinking, but the, pen, the high frequency traders won't pay away half the capital. They'll just stop doing it. And I was trying to rationalize it. Um, and I went back to the document. And that was the next line. And the next line was, um, uh, as a result, high frequency trading will be more or less eliminated. And it went on to say, this is one of the most attractive features of the financial transaction tax. I said, well, that's fine. But was the point not that the HFT were going to be the payers of this rather than the pension funds? And three lines have said, no, it won't be the pension funds, it will be the HFT, and they'll stop being active so they won't pay, so it will be the pension funds. It's just tremendous. And it goes on in the same vein in other points. It talks about the avoidance and the way to make it a, a, a tax that no one tries to avoid is by making it a light tax with heavy penalties. But in the paragraph before, they were saying they were going to take away 50% of your capital if you're an HFT, so it doesn't look like a very light tax that there'll be little incentive to avoid. Um, the truth of the matter, I think, is that um, the less we say about this tax, the better, because um, the reasons put forward for supporting it aren't actually the reasons that the people who are putting it forward um, hold dear. Um, it's about appearing to react to the financial crisis. It's about appearing to be hard on the financial sector. Um, and 
the fact that it's the pension funds and the raisers of capital that bear the burden is just an embarrassing truth to um, those that, um, that seek to advance the tax. Well, thank you, Stephen. Are there any questions for the panel? Then allow me to just share a data point. Uh, in November 2011, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary seminar of the Taiwan Stock Exchange, the Ministry of Finance in Taiwan announced they were going to reduce a significant portion of the equivalent of a transaction tax that they have in Taiwan. It's also interesting to note in many of the Asian countries, they don't have a capital gains tax. So the existing transaction taxes are really the only means for them to collect. So clearly, um, there is an observation. I'd just like to actually maybe take your point, Stephen, about maybe moving on to a related theme. And really, when we're taking a look at frictional costs, uh, we're also looking at the implicit cost, which includes a relationship around themes like tick size. And what's very interesting, Stephen and the others on the panel, and many of you in this room in Europe, played a very significant role really addressing the point that Steve Leagood mentioned earlier, which is why doesn't the industry get up and do things? Actually, I think in the concept of setting a harmonized tick size regime, that's the regime for the minimum price improvement for individual stocks, actually this has been a quiet success. And Stephen, I'm gonna to come to you in a minute because you've also played a very significant role in this. Um, and just to highlight comparison, why it can be so positive. I mean, here we are in Istanbul and Istanbul Borsasi itself in 2010 made a number of significant market improvements. They introduced anonymity of broker identifiers, allowed the cancellation of orders, but also introduced a phased reduction of tick sizes. And the net result is, if you look at the World Federation of Exchange statistics, that the December month, which is normally a quiet month for exchanges, December for Istanbul was higher than every previous month during that year. And clearly, there's an opportunity to try and get an ideal tick size. So Stephen, from your perspective, taking a look as an industry, uh, what was it about the tick size debate that got people involved, and why do you think it's been a benefit? Thank you. Um, I think what got people involved was the persuasive power of large customers and public trading venues. I think there were um, public trading venues that discovered that they had clients that had quite portable flow in that they, they, they didn't need to, um, to execute that business on their platform and who made quite explicit threats that they would exercise that freedom to take their flow away um, unless that trading venue succumbed to their desire to have very small ticks. Um, and I think uh, a number of trading venues found themselves commercially powerless to resist the pressure to have small ticks and ultimately to have ever smaller ticks um, because uh, once you start feeding that sort of habit they will keep coming back to the well and um, the, there was those of us in the industry who saw this as a potential threat and who coordinated a number of the venues that were under these pressures to come together and to stand resolutely um, against that pressure um, in support of a standardized tick size. Thank you. Ralph, I'm going to come to you in just a moment, but I think just also to share some interesting history. I actually do think, Stephen, if you recall, it was Chiax itself, which was one of the catalysts. I think uh, Graham Dick sitting in the front row, I think he may have even come to the Investment Banking Association with the data that the number of stocks where a new entrant had a different and lower tick size than, say, the London Stock Exchange was only six or seven names, and yet you seem to be getting more market share winning in more names than the ones that you had difference in tick size. What's the insight? Tick size itself does not have to be a source of competitive advantage, and clearly as an industry, we might be better in harmonizing an ideal in terms of tick regime. I think also Deutsche Börse had also been promoting spread leeway <coughs> concept, and I think with BATS, Chiax, LSE, the number of exchanges in this room, uh, including the Swiss exchange, all coming together in a consensus. That was a great example over probably 12 to 18 months to get to an ideal framework. But Ralph, you also have a view from your perspective. Thank you. Yeah, okay. We, we, we followed uh, the discussion with interest, but then again, I mean, we, we, we are uh, there for the private clients and uh, in, for the private clients, I and mean, we are functioning slightly different. Uh, for many, many years, we have something which we call best price principle. That's what 
how we want to attract private clients. So that means always at least as good as the as the best price out there over all those venues or better, which uh, ended up uh, actually a few years ago already that we are providing choice prices for the blue chips. So of course, I mean we are we are sticking to the regime you just outlined, but I mean for us it's it, it's sort of the wider side uh, of the scale. So we are we're often inside there, of course only for retail size. Thank you, Ralph and. Brian, I'll give you the last word. I'll keep it brief. Yeah, I mean, I agree with the comment. I think it is an example where um, there was a very open, productive dialogue between MTFs, between exchanges, between market participants. Um, I, again, I just underline, I think, what Steve has said. It is a matter, though, of getting the balance right, because this is one where you, there can be. It's a little bit like the latency debate. Every gets, everybody gets fixated on fastest is best, and it, it is... Yes, for some players, smallest tick size is best. Yes, but for some players. And actually, in, 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 I think where we've gotten to now is probably right, even though it's worth looking at it again in the context of even since the, the, the kind of the, the tick size regime was put in place, the markets have changed quite fundamentally. And I think there's a particular challenge to, let's call it, the, the dedicated liquidity providers. And I'm not talking about the electronic liquidity providers, the get-go, the citadels. I'm talking more about the you know, capital dedicated to market making. And that is in shorter supply than it ever was before. And I think the impact of that and the, the balance of that with tick sizes is, is something that, that needs to be given kind of due, due account, basically, and coming to the right position. Thank you, Brian. Sorry, Stephen, you want to add? Um, yes, I, I would simply add that um, for me, tick size is a, is a job unfinished. Um, there was an agreement made between venues um, that related to blue chip stocks. Um, that agreement has been partially implemented and it has been partially deviated from um, since being implemented, but it leaves the rest of Europe. Um, and I would agree that um, there's a balance to be found and I, I wouldn't profess to know where that balance is. Um, all I would say is that for in an ideal world or an ideal Europe, we would have a set of um, tick tables that give you ever larger ticks and all the stocks would be on one of those tables regardless of which venue it was on and there would be some grown-up sensible way of deciding when to move a stock from one table to another but to stop the nonsense of trying to innovate around tick tables and to try and use different tick tables for blue chips from less liquid stocks preventing the fragmentation of those less liquid stocks. Sorry, question of Graham Bick. Thank you. Hello? In fact, it's not really a question, it's in reaction to what um, Stephen just said, and I guess it's uh, news that um, it's really happening at the moment, because um, you're right in what you say, Stephen, that work wasn't unfinished. Um, and after a couple of years of relative calm, um, what has happened is the group of MTS and the Feezy group are, have now sat around a table um, again, and this has happened over the last month or so, um, looking to harmonise across the larger Well, Graham, thank you very much. That's a nice way to wrap up this particular session. I think there are two key insights. Number one, this is an example of the industry working together. It can take some time, but it's worth it. And secondly, it's worth reviewing periodically ticks in the context of the economic environment because tick sizes should be set on a per stock liquidity optimization. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to break for 20 minutes, and then you're coming back to the two most final dynamic panels of today's World Exchange Congress. Let's thank our experts on the panel. Thank you very much.